Good afternoon. Um, just wanted to, uh, this was a tech stop project. Uh, we finished up uh, a year, a little over a year ago. Uh, we had quite a large uh, team on the, on the project and just recognized that, that team um, as well as our tech stop uh, partners. Um, if if y'all are looking for true design stuff and schematics and stuff, this is not going to be it. Uh, it. It's an overview of our entire project. Um, so I, I took a before and after approach, uh, and and we had uh, some of the pictures from before and after. Uh, the top picture is uh, had basically the from the HOV lane. It was a reversible HOV, uh, three lanes on each side, two lane frontage roads. Uh, almost the, the managed lane section is almost as big as uh, half the cross section. So we had, uh, they took in a lot more right away. We were able to uh, really uh, do a, a good job on the geometrics uh, in that regard. Uh, so some of the main research tasks uh, you can see there, we had 10 of them. Uh, again, a, a pretty in-depth thing. I'm only going to cover three of them. Uh, mainly the, the lane separation and access design and then kind of go into a little bit of the maintenance where, where things uh, cross over. Uh, try to give a little bit of perspective of the background and history of this project, um, the, the Katie Managed Lane project that is, uh, and then go a little bit, uh, try to touch on the geometrics uh, and then some of the congestion issues that have come up. Uh, not necessarily because of the geometrics, but just because of our growth in the area, and then come up with a, a conclusions and some of the future challenges. Uh, so overall, uh, you, I've kind of listed out here in this table the uh, uh, we, we went from before we're essentially doubling uh, the access along the f uh, facility, um, and it was uh, did have a. Uh, option to have two plus tolling uh, in the in the latter years of the Katy free, uh, the old Katy freeway design and they've gone to three different uh, toll sections in the new design um, there was uh, a lot of different access types uh, we had direct merge uh, we had T ramps uh, we had lane ads uh, lane drops uh, so we had a little bit of everything uh, to look at uh, and the, uh, this is just an overall schematic of where all the entrances and exits are. Uh, we're, we're going from east to west. Uh, these are uh, direct access and direct remove. And then uh, again, there's the T-ramp at the, at the end there. Uh, and I'll be talking more about those uh, later in the presentation. So the before conditions, we had essentially a one-lane reversible uh, HOV lane that uh, was virtually at capacity. Um, the, again, the general purpose lanes were also at capacity. Uh, I think uh, Lomax was estimating that we had uh, 10 hours of congestion in a day on a typical day. Uh, if we had a lovely accident or something, that would stretch things out. Uh, you might have gotten a little bit of relief around uh, 2 in the afternoon and, and then maybe at 11, but even noon time was bad. Um, so it, it was a bad facility. Uh, on the HOV side, uh, we've been running uh, about 15 to 1600 vehicles per hour in the, in the peak hour, which is pretty much capacity at, at, uh, uh, for the HOV lane. And uh, we, we have essentially the same hours of operation. The only thing that's changed uh, significantly is the uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, the weekend. Uh, before it used to be inbound on Saturday and outbound on Sunday. Uh, and, and now uh, we have two directions uh, and it's toll uh, for those uh, weekend days. Uh, we also changed uh, the major pieces uh, that the biggest significant view is the is the separation and I'll go into a lot more detail about that later in the presentation but basically we were a barrier separated concrete barriers 
and we changed to a buffer with with a set of pylons in the middle, um, and we'll go through some of those. Um, I will note that uh, the operating agency was TxDOT, and they uh, maintained the the pavements in the early years, and, and Metro operated uh, the facility. In other words, they handled the enforcement of the HOV lane, um, and and the, all the things that went along with that. Uh, and then in the after period, uh, Hectra took over, and they uh, did all those functions in addition to collecting tolls. Uh, and then here uh, recently in the past three to six months, uh, the Hectra has uh, reverted back to TxDOT and um, so those are still uh, a work in progress and uh, we'll see how that uh, goes forward here in the next year or so. Um, as, as a general cross section, um, again, we've got very optimal conditions. We've got shoulders uh, on both sides of the pylon of the managed lanes. Uh, we've got a left shoulder even on the managed lane uh, and then even on the general purpose lanes. Uh, at the toll plazas, they actually flare out to three lanes um, and that was done originally to try to uh, do some HOV declaration. Uh, when they actually started to operate it, they said, no, we're just going to have the two lanes and once we get enough congestion, we'll see what we want to do with that third lane. Um, so uh, some of the overall decisions um, w through, it was an uh, overall partnership uh, early on and uh, TxDOT and Hectra and Metro were all partners. As a matter of fact, they also often refer to a tri-party agreement uh, on who was going to do what. And uh, so, uh, but uh, for instance, the uh, funding Hectra put in some money uh, for right away uh, and and uh, to operate that toll lane after it was completed. Uh, Metro threw in some money because uh, they wanted. Uh, potential to put in a train, so they beefed up some of the bridges along the way. Uh, there was a lot of political interest um, through local congressmen uh, and the local officials, uh, so there was a lot of input there. And uh, But overall, the, the access is, is uh, pretty open. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility there. There's a lot of real estate to uh, to accommodate uh, new things as we come up, uh, as we meet challenges, uh, and we've done so already uh, to, to alleviate some of those. Um, and so, um, so we, we've built on uh, uh, a, a lot of experience um, in, the, in the managed lane area. Uh, 25 years of HOV design in the Houston area and operation, and that kind of goes hand in hand. They've they've been tweaking the design as they build a new one. They learn some things from the old ones. Um, we have a lot of those barrier uh, facilities. Uh, we also have some buffer separated facilities on the outer ends uh, of the of the facilities as congestion increases. Uh, we tend to exceed where we already have a, a HOV lane and so the policy or the ideas have been is to grab that inside shoulder, make it an HOV lane and extend that out just a little bit further to try to get folks in uh, and give them the benefit of using that HOV facility. Um, I will point out that um, in 2002 there was a, a, a research project that looked at uh, weaving studies uh, for HOVs on how, uh, how the distance required to uh, go from an, egg, uh, from an entrance ramp all the way to the um, entrance ramp of the HOV lane. So how, what distance is that needed? And so that sort of information was used on the Katy Banage lanes and it worked fairly well. Um, and overall the experience has been, uh, has been a pretty good design. So uh, looking in some, some of the particular areas, we looked at um, a few of the uh, entrance and exit locations uh, and, and Marcus led this area and uh, we, we went through a lot of video. We recorded a lot of video and they watched, uh, we had a whole lot of students watching a lot of video 
and to look for uh, how many people crossed the line before they should, uh, were they able to make the exit that they had planned on, uh, those kinds of things, how many missed the exit, um, and, and those kinds of things. And you can see we did that for, for these four types, uh, the direct merge sites, um, which were like the uh, post oak entrance ramp, uh, the attics T ramp, uh, and then um, we had some uh, cross weaving facilities at Be Beltway 8. It's where we looked at how long it took people to actually move all the way across six or seven lanes of traffic uh, to make their exit. Uh, and then at the western edge is what we call the funnel where it was uh, basically we had a diamond lane and then a, an, a true entrance adding a lane uh, to the facility. So. Uh, the, the top part here is, is uh, you know, the direct merge, uh, the, the different locations that we looked at. Um, overall, what we found is the, the design was sufficient to, uh, to meet those challenges. Uh, we had a little bit of problems, uh, and I'll go into a little more detail about the T-ramp and what was done there. Uh, but we, it is pretty sensitive to the, to the uh, traffic volumes that are out there. Um, and then uh, the early and late maneuvers during the peak period we had some issues with um, as, as conge uh, congestion on the managed lane and the HOV lane, or excuse me, on the general purpose lanes build up, we're able to uh, having some issues. So um, when we talk about the cross weave, we looked in particular, so the question was is, do people have enough space to, as they exit the uh, managed lanes, could they get to here to make this direct connect there? Uh, so we looked at, we tried to trace cars through video all the way from uh, the exit to the entrance of that. Uh, found out almost virtually no problem with that. Uh, many people exited the the lanes early, in other words, they kind of crossed over the line a little early because they were anxious and wanted to make sure they got over there. Uh, but what we found is that uh, many, most of them made it through without any problems at all. So overall, uh, the design worked well. Um, again, at the, at the funnel, uh, what we kind of, uh, in reality, what we were looking at was congested conditions on the general purpose lane, so there was really not a lot of problem people getting into uh, the HOV lane. They were glad to get into those managed lanes, uh, and so we'll go with that. So congestion, um, and believe it or not, this is um, about two or three years after the facility was built. And uh, there was an incident this, this early morning, uh, but you can see every lane is full, even the frontage roads over here and the managed lanes. And this is the, we're looking down the T ramp uh, down here. Uh, and so there, are, there, are, there is congestion out there on a daily basis. Um, a lot of that's from the latent demand and the large growth in the energy quarter district. Uh, but so the two areas I'd like to talk about are uh, the Attics T ramp and uh, North Post Oak um, here at these two locations. And we had some uh, issues with congestion at those, uh, especially on the managed lane side. So the Post Oak entrance uh, is, is a direct, uh, direct merge. And what it originally had was uh, from the Post Oak uh, Transit Center, you had one lane and it merged with another lane that came up from underneath the West Loop. And those merged together into one lane and there was an, a, a very, very wide shoulder, I believe is over 20 feet wide, uh, that accommodated further downstream uh, an entrance from the general purpose lanes. Uh, there was a lot of congestion, some accidents here. Uh, and so uh, Hectra uh, looked at that and they essentially restriped that, made two lanes there and forced that merge down here uh, further down 
uh, uh, and, and that's worked out very well over the past uh, two, two or so years. Um, so on the Highway 6 side, um, th there was also uh, some other challenges there. Uh, it, it had a moderate ramp volume, uh, roughly four to 600 uh, during the peak hour, um, and a lot of those were buses though. The managed lanes, uh, as you saw from the picture, uh, managed lanes were uh, highly congested. Um, and typically early on in the, in the morning, it uh, uh, operates pretty well. Uh, people are going 60 miles an hour and uh, very small gaps. Well, that bus comes down that T-ramp and uh, there are, there's no gaps. So it stops and it waits and the traffic backs up and then they get gutsy and they pull out and that just kind of starts the queue propagation and, and then there's no problem getting in after that. <laughs> so, uh, but it takes that first guy. But anyway, that's not exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, and so uh, what, what they've done is they extended that weaving distance uh, a little bit, capturing some of that shoulder um, and, and increased that by a little over a quarter of a mile. We still have some congestion. Uh, they've increased the tolls. Uh, matter of fact, they've increased the tolls three times now, I think. Uh, it started out at $4 end-to-end uh, -end trip, and we're now at $7 end-to-end um, -end trip. And uh, we're still at capacity on, on our tolling uh, facilities uh, during the peak hour. So. Pricing is, is going to be a tool that we're going to have to use a little bit more and a little more stringently. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to solve some of those issues through that. Um, again, uh, just more pictures of, of the congestion. Um, this next piece is, is on lane separation. So uh, one question was is, the, uh, the separation, these pylon separations, do the, how well do they work versus the, the barriers? Um, and uh, they, they work pretty well. There's several types of separation. Um, the buffer separated, which would be just the separate, uh, if there was no pylons in here, just you know blank space. Uh, then we have a pylon is the next. And pylons can either be curb or like these. These are just pavement mounted. Uh, and then the last type of separation is a, a concrete barrier, CTB type. Uh, and we looked at uh, cost comparison and then some of the factors you might want to consider for that. So when we looked at this, we tried to do an apples to apples comparison looking at a buffer separation of uh, four feet, which is what would be uh, uh, typical on a, on a central traffic barrier type situation. We did some background and looked at, uh, interviewed and looked in the literature. And uh, this graph that we see is uh, the buffer width, uh, which is this down here at the bottom, versus the pylon replacement. And this is pylons replaced per year. So if we have 100% um, and it looks like the numbers got skewed there. Um, but if we have 100% uh, pylons um, replacement, that would essentially mean that you replaced every pylon from end to end in one year's time. Now, that's not actually what happens. Usually it's the pylons at the entrance and exit locations get replaced about 10 times, and some of them never get replaced. But uh, there, there is certainly a relationship between the buffer width and so KD managed lanes is down here at about 20%, although they have about a 22 foot buffer in between there. Uh, some of the locations that have one foot and two foot uh, have a much higher replacement rate. Uh, so those are some things that you're gonna, it's a trade off. You've got some first time costs versus the maintenance cost of having to replace those uh, and kind of the headache that goes along with it. The, monthly, weekly, quarterly type things having to go out there all the time. So what we did is kind of looked at a cost comparison 
And I will tell you that this does not include right of way. <laughs> so when you factor in right of way, uh, these numbers probably change significantly. Uh, but we're looking at the Katy managed lane, and so uh, we assume that they'd have a 20% uh, maintenance cost. Uh, and the CTB, uh, we talked to a lot of the folks at the district and said, well, how often do you do it? What do you do? And basically, they had to straighten out the barriers every now and again when they had major crashes, these kinds of things. And so we put in that factor. So we have, the pylons still look like a pretty good deal uh, when you have that much right of way. Again, that's not included in that cost. So. Uh, if we looked at uh, the four-foot separation, uh, the numbers changed significantly uh, because of this maintenance factor. So again, when you use all these different considerations, which we'll go through some of them, um, right away uh, was the biggest consideration, has the biggest impact on maintenance, as you saw from those cost comparisons, um, and, and it's a direct relationship there. Uh, some other things that you need to consider out when you're looking at the design is, uh, you know, what does the region have? Are they all buffer separated or are they, are they barrier separated? What are people expecting? Um, there's a cost to enforcement. If, if the, um, we have some incident management uh, focus uh, as well that could be used. Um, so overall, uh, the, the pylons are lower first time cost, but there's a, there's a higher maintenance cost. Um, and, and that most of the uh, hit rates are at the entrance and exit locations. Um, I'll slide through with this because they're giving me the five minute warning. <laughs> uh, so some of the major conclusions, so uh, the designs work relatively well uh, we, there were some tweaks that, that had to have been done, um, and, and there's more coming. Uh, I'm sure with uh, we've got you know huge populations coming in, um, and and so the Katy uh, Freeway is is still congested, um, and I will follow that up. The full report uh, is available uh, at the website. 